how the synagogue of Satan works in high places. The idea of a one world government can be presented in a manner which makes it sound reasonable, practical, and even desirable. Clever agent you of the Illuminati, belonging to clubs and societies, serve the purpose of the synagogue of Satan by presenting what appear to be sound arguments in favor of a one world government to those they can persuade to listen. Very few of the rank and file members of the clubs and societies suspect that beyond the end of the primrose path of liberalism and social security that leads to a one world government is a precipice over which we are to be tumbled into the abyss of absolute slavery of body, mind, and soul. I am frank to admit that as late as 1945 I was convinced that a one world government was the only solution to the world's many problems particularly political, economic, social, and religious. It wasn't until I came in personal contact with men who advocated and helped organize the United Nations organization that I began to suspect that something was wrong somewhere. When I was appointed to the staff of Naval Service Headquarters in 1944, as the author of seven books already published, I was welcomed into the internationalist set. This I came in personal contact with men in the top level of government in Canada who were protégés of William Lyon Mackenzie King, then Prime Minister. His house was real close to the Soviet Embassy. His henchman, hatchet man would be a better word or ruthless and unscrupulous. Mackenzie King himself was as inscrutable as the proverbial Sphinx. The Prime Minister was an extraordinary man. He was indefatigable. He required unlimited obedience and service from those he selected for his cabinet. He was a good deal colder than nice as far as his personality was concerned. If he had any human emotions he kept them in sub-zero storage. He rarely smiled. He had a typical poker face. His eyes were deep and penetrating, but if the eyes are the windows of the soul then Mackenzie King had lost his soul long before he ever became Prime Minister. In the course of his public duties he had to meet people and shake hands. Those who did shake hands with the Prime Minister say the experience reminded them of picking up a dead fish. It was said on Parliament Hill that he didn't have a close friend in all the world. If there was an exception, it was his barber. And yet he had a secret power which enabled him to mesmerize the voters into voting him, and his Liberal Party, into power time after time for nearly a quarter of a century. He could command loyalty from his subordinates without giving friendship in return. He proved himself a radical during his days at Toronto University. He would set the tinder, supply the spark, cause a disturbance, and then leave others to take the blame. During his university days he was friendless, as he was later on in life. As one man who knew him when at university, and served him afterwards until he died, said in a puzzled tone of voice, if Mackenzie King did have a friend close enough to confide in, it must have been the devil, another said. He was so steeped in international intrigue he didn't dare marry for fear he might talk in his sleep. While I was on the staff in Ottawa I was carefully sounded out to determine if my loyalty to the British Crown was so pronounced that I wouldn't be likely to accept the idea of a one world government even if those who presented the idea emphasized the fact that national governments would be allowed to rule their own affairs. This presentation is so obviously a lie that I was extremely cautious from then on. Knowing that there was in existence a secret power which had used Nazism and intended to use communism to serve its own secret plans and further its own ambitions to usurp undisputed world domination, I was determined to find out, if possible, who or what the secret power was. So I pretended to become an internationalist. 
I was then brought in personal contact with men at the deputy minister level of government, and also with some of the specialists, experts, and advisors who serve the government behind the scenes. Then I began to suspect the truth. Generally speaking, the majority of these one-worlders were Satanists. They docked attending church services. They ridiculed religion. They accepted the Freudian code of morals, which means they didn't care what they did, or with whom they did it, provided they satisfied their own carnal pleasures and desires. If they used the name of God, they always took his name in vain. If they used the words, Jesus Christ, it was an injection in ordinary conversations, or coupled with dirty four-letter words. Without openly professing the fact, they were obviously adepts of Pike's Paladian Rite or Grand Orient Masonry. Close observation while they were drinking in the officers' messes, and elsewhere, showed they used signs that Masons and Knights of Columbus didn't understand. I may be wrong but observation of men who had obviously defected from God and become Satanists convinced me they could recognize and identify each other by the fold of their handkerchief which they wore in top pocket of their coats. They obviously accepted Pike's dogma as far as women were concerned. Pike required that the members of all councils of his new and reformed Paladian Rite organize selected females into councils of adoption. These women were to be used as the common property of the male members because, according to Pike's dogma, before a member became perfect, he had to obtain absolute control over the sentiments of the heart and desires of the flesh. He claimed that many men were led astray from the path of duty because they were weak enough to feel love and affection for women. He argued that in order for a member to become perfect, he, page 55 Satan, prince of this world must obtain absolute control over his senses and sentiments, and suggested that the best way to obtain control over the sexual urges is to use women, often and without passion and thus enchain women to their wool. I found that some of the top-level internationalists swapped wives during parties. Professor Raymond Boyer, top-level scientist, and Canadian millionaire, and E.V. Field, American millionaire, locked together in international intrigue and subversion as proved by both Canadian and American government investigating committees, carried this practice to the extent that they swapped each other's wives for good, and made the exchange legal in the eyes of civil lay by going through a ceremony the new papers called marriage. What does God think of such practices? These people were all far too intelligent to be atheists. They know there is the supernatural as well as the natural. Therefore, if they defect from God they automatically become Satanists as far as this world is concerned, and Lucifer Ian as far as the next world is concerned. For further details see pages 212 and 212. 13 Red Fog Over America If these top-level intellectuals who advocate the establishment of a one-world government intended to put God's plan for the rule of the whole of the universe into effect upon this earth it hardly seems likely that they would pack the civil services of all remaining governments with homosexuals. Any person who has had to live in London, Ottawa and or Washington knows that as far as homosexualism is concerned all three are modern cities like Sodom and Gomorrah. Burgess and McLean case is typical of what I mean. Professor Pitt Ramsayer Olkin of Harvard University published an exposure of this angle of the Lucifer Ian conspiracy in a book entitled The American Sex Revolution. The author states that perverted sexual behavior plays a major part in modern U.S. political life and that sex bribery and blackmail are now as prevalent as monetary corruption. He states, sexually infamous persons, or their prot 6 g 6 are being appointed to ambassadorships and other high offices. Profligates sometimes become popular mayors of metropolises, members of cabinets, or leaders of political parties. 
Among our political officials, there is a vast legion of profligates, both heterosexual and homosexual. Our morals have changed so notably that continency, chastity, and faithfulness are increasingly viewed as oddities. Professor Sir Oaken's book didn't get the same kind, or volume, of publicity as did Dr. Kinsey's books dealing with the alleged moral practices of males and females. According to Satanism, it is perfectly right and proper to encourage moral turpitude in all class of society and at all levels of government by convincing the public that abnormal sexual behavior is normal and that the moral code accepted by civilized nations based on the commandments of God and teachings of the Holy Scriptures, is old-fashioned and introduced by church and state for selfish purposes. But behind the building up of a wrong conception of sex, and its purposes as intended by God our Creator, is the satanic principle that, the best revolutionary is a youth absolutely devoid of morals. When Lenin stated this as recorded in Pawns in the Game, he only confirmed what other Satanists had stated a hundred times previously. It is Satanism, as it is direct from the top, which is responsible for the increase in juvenile delinquency, but those selected by the governments of the world to investigate this problem invariably give every cause other than the right one. I have discussed the causes of juvenile delinquency with the heads of church and state in Canada since 1923, but the synagogue of Satan has always proved strong enough to prevent any truthful public explanation of the cause and the purpose of those who direct the Luciferian conspiracy at the top. On the other hand, thousands of letters have been received from parents who read the red fog over America, thanking us for explaining the causes which produce the effect we term juvenile delinquency. They tell us they find it much easier to counteract evil influences when they can explain clearly and truthfully to their children the reason Satanists work so hard to wean young people away from God by teaching them lies regarding sex. I repeat again, there is nothing wrong, nothing degrading, nothing to be ashamed of in sexual relationship as intended by God, but a great deal is wrong when multitudes deify sex the promiscuous worship of the human body, and cunningly and slyly make each succeeding generation of human beings believe premarital experience, every form of sexual depravity and vice, is absolutely normal, providing pleasure is derived from such indulgences, and that continency, chastity, and faithfulness are old-fashioned. The point I wish to make is this the vast majority of men and women who sponsor and direct the campaign for a one world government, other than communism, are just as bitterly opposed to God as are the communists. The vast majority who promote the idea that a one world government run by Luciferian intellectuals, rather than atheistic communists, is the only solution to our problems are as devoid of morals as the proverbial mink. If they are against God and against atheistic communism, they must be Luciferian. Confirmation of the above opinion was obtained when I discussed the relationship of changing public opinion regarding morals and spiritual values and the increase of juvenile delinquency with a top-level official of the Department of Health and Welfare in Canada. After a lengthy discussion, during which his attitude and facial expression showed he found it hard to believe that a man of my experience could still place spiritual values above material considerations, my companion literally snorted. Well, what do you suggest we do? clean every homosexual out of the civil service, and throw them in prison where they can indulge their queer ideas of pleasure to their heart's desire. Many of them are brilliantly minded men. When on the job they are, page 56 Satan, prince of this world efficient and work long hours. You seem to forget Oscar Wilde was a homosexual. Stop trying to save the human race. The vast majority aren't worth the time or the trouble. Most of them will be better off if they are forced to live under a totalitarian dictatorship, 
they will then get what the government decides is good for them because I expressed old-fashioned ideas regarding sin, morals, and marriage vows. Some intellectuals I met decided I needed to have my mind cleaned. Exactly what Weishaupt said was to be done in 1776. I was brought in contact with the internationally famous specialist in mental health. This man was a graduate of the Freudian School of Psychiatry. He had studied in Vienna. He was on the staff of Dr. Brock Chisholm, who was Canada's Minister of Health and Welfare at the time. Chisholm afterwards became the first president of the UNOS Health and Mental Health Organizations. This man tried in a very friendly manner to change my ideas. I listened, I pretended to be interested, but I still remain to be convinced that God, who gave us the commandments, is wrong and Luciferianism which teaches the inversion of those commandments, is right. I read history, which mostly records wars and revolutions and therefore, the progress of the world revolutionary movement, to try to find out the cause which produced these destructive forces which result in such terrible sufferings. I thought at the time the lessons history teaches, if applied to past mistakes, could provide the solution to most of our problems. I was even then deceived into believing government was of the people, by the people, for the people. But a study of modern history showed that the younger generation is being taught to believe a pack of lies and deceits. Personal experience exposed this fact. When in the hospital in 1945, I laid on my back and pondered over this strange truth. People who write history are not ignorant or fools. If they deliberately published lies and deceits with the knowledge and consent of our governments, then they must have a definite purpose. It was then I began to obtain books which recorded hidden history, and I delved and dug deeper and deeper with the cooperation of one of Canada's leading librarians, until I was able to learn about the doubled lives men like Weishaupt and Pike had led. But although I continued studying and reading it was not until 1956, after Ponds and the Red Fog had been published, that I finally realized that the Illuminati, whose secret plot and intentions I had exposed, were controlled at the top by the Synagogue of Satan. It wasn't until I was given information regarding Pike's dual personality that I was able to dig up proof that the synagogue of Satan is controlled by the high priests of the Luciferian creed. Once I had penetrated this secret it became obvious that the wars and revolutions which plague the world today are part and parcel of the Luciferian conspiracy and that all aspects of the world revolutionary movement are part of that conspiracy. Historians are restricted to recording events as they happen. They are not permitted to indulge in making deductions or surmises. My problem was to find out a way in which I could leave off recording history and obtain evidence which would enable me to project the course line, party line in communist and illuminist double talk into the future and onto its logical conclusion the formation of a worldwide totalitarian dictatorship, and the imposition of the Luciferian ideology upon what is left of the human race. I could expose the conspiracy, its ultimate purpose, and objectives by quoting from the writings of Weishaupt, Mazzini, Pike, Lemmy Lennon, Churchill, Roosevelt, and others, but I knew I would be accused of forgery and lunacy. I had to find documentary evidence. I had to find confirmation of the truth, as it had been revealed to me, in a book or among documents, which the greatest encyclopedists wouldn't dare to challenge. Then a strange thing happened. I was lying flat on my back on a fracture board. I had read everything within reach. I was tired thinking. I was bored. Then a thought entered my mind. I had read all the history one could get my hands on except Bible history. I asked for a Bible and a King James Version was brought to me. 
I glanced through the pages wondering if I had the willpower and intestinal fortitude to weigh through such an imposing volume. Then, after I had read a verse which threw light on present day conditions another thought entered my mind, why don't you use the Bible as a yardstick to measure the correctness of the truth or error in the evidence you have gathered and particularly as regards the projections you are going to make and the conclusions you are going to draw? That seemed a really good idea. It would save me the time it would have required to read both the Old and the New Testaments. From then on I used the Bible, the inspired Word of God to help me separate the wheat from the chaff as I browsed through the evidence which filled several trunks and filing cabinets. Page 57 Satan, Prince of this World